Good morning everyone, I'm Matt Horton, I'm an AWS Community Builder and AWS Ambassador. I work at an insure tech called CDO in the UK and this talk is the story of our database migration to AWS. I joined CDO in 2014 as an Oracle DBA and we operated from two data centres in Stockport and they cost us about £4 million each to build. As you all know, customers demand high availability for software solutions. So in addition to the two data centers, we built out a robust database architecture running Oracle. We had Oracle real application clusters. So within a single data center, if the database failed, it would move on to one of two additional nodes. If all the nodes in the data center failed, that was okay because we were running data guard. So we could fail over to the other data center, which had the exact same three node cluster set up. The database software ran on Oracle Enterprise Linux with KSplice to allow us to patch the operating system with minimal downtime. And we ran Oracle VM on top of Oracle hardware with CPU pinning to meet our license requirements. We had NetApp storage that gave us mirroring of backups over dedicated links between the two data centers. And we had monitoring provided by Oracle Enterprise Manager and something called Rundeck to help us schedule and manage all of our database jobs. As you can see, we were all in on Oracle. We had a team of Oracle DBAs, and we also ran our middleware on Oracle WebLogic. There was a lot to look after, but it all worked, and we were rightly proud of the high availability we delivered to our customers. When our licensing deal came up for renewal though, the price changed, and it quickly became apparent that we needed to be able to move to another database engine to have a cost-optimized solution. At this point in late 2015, we had also started looking into the cloud with AWS and we were developing a brand new product on AWS. But we still saw a need at that time for on-premise deployments for our flagship product that ran on Oracle. So some of our DBAs started looking, out, looking at building out a new PostgreSQL architecture that would work both in the cloud and on-premise. We spent about six months trying to develop the on-premise architecture you see here. PostgreSQL running on VMware, NetApp storage, Patroni for failover, which required us to provision an ETCD uh, cluster for distributed configuration store. Uh, NetApp at the time didn't have a driver for PostgreSQL. So for database snap snapshots, we had to write our own scripts. We got this stack built, but then one day we did an upgrade on Patroni and it failed. We got really stuck and it took us a while to bring it all back. At this point, CDO had announced that we were cloud first, but not yet cloud only. However, our software engineering management took the decision not to build out a database service on premise. It was gonna to be too much work and we hadn't actually got to work on the business problem yet, which was migration of our core application from Oracle to PostgreSQL. We were working on plumbing that we thought was needed to work on the business problem. It would be easy to write off the on-premise work on PostgreSQL as a total failure, but it really wasn't. The team at this point had Oracle DBA job titles, remember? So learning PostgreSQL from the ground up taught us a lot and helped us a lot later on. Moving to Amazon RDS removed a lot of the fear of all the plumbing work and the potential failures we might need to deal with. We were still learning, but it shifted away from infrastructure. And we started looking at things like PG stat statements, CloudWatch, PG Badger, and learning the differences in dialects between SQL in PostgreSQL and Oracle. So let's have a look at the steps that you'll typically want to take when you do a database migration from Oracle to PostgreSQL. First of all, you want to point the schema conversion tool or SCT at your database. And this is gonna give you a report on what you're going to need to change. It's kind of a one-time thing and you're gonna get a set of database scripts out of this. Next, you need to get your data over to Amazon RDS. And for this, you need to use a change data capture or CDC tool. And this will transfer your tables, your primary keys and your data. Next, you look at migrating over your views, functions, database indexes, and other database objects. 
Any PLSQL code will need to be converted into the Postgres equivalent. And you may have lots of work involved in removing Oracle specific, specific functions. Some of these could be in your database code, but also some could be in your application code. We found an Oracle feature in our business intelligence solution that had no equivalent in PostgreSQL. A bit more on that later. So with CDC, transactions are read from the source online transaction processing database and are sent in our case via click replicate into AWS. And the transactions are applied to an Amazon RDS instance. There are other CDC tools available. Amazon, for example, offer the database migration service. We used Click as we already had experience with it, so it made sense to us not to have to learn another thing. So to deploy a Click-based solution, here is what you need. A source database, Click Replicate, Click Enterprise Manager, and a target database. And these components all need to be able to communicate with each other, so we apply appropriate AWS security groups. You also need to have click replicate tasks defined to process the data between the source and the target. And for us, um, we recommend using the APIs available through Click Enterprise Manager to automate registration of replicate servers and the creation of those task definitions. So this is a demo I recorded a couple of years ago, but it's still very relevant. It's using Terraform and we deploy all of the required components to take data from an existing source database, Oracle in this instance, and replicate that data through change data capture, click replicate to Amazon AWS S3. The Terraform creates all of the EC2 instances required to run the click software. It will then add in the source and the target endpoint configuration, and finally create the task, a definition that takes data from the source database and loads it into S3. So here you can see the infrastructure that's been provisioned all through infrastructure as code. The server's been created and we've created a task definition automatically to take customer data from Oracle and land that into S3. Another great use case for CDC is to help you move towards an event-driven architecture. And tools like Click Replicate support multiple targets even when using a large relational database as a source. With a streaming platform like Kafka we can have both near instantaneous reporting and also um, use modern event driven architectures that respond to events on the stream. You can then start to build out new functionality for your solution using loosely coupled software components such as serverless lambda functions consuming and processing, processing events from that stream. And building systems around an event-driven architecture like this simplify your horizontal scalability and makes your systems much more resilient to failure. In addition to using Enterprise Manager for um, our deployments, we also use it to track our database migrations. We like that the REST API has been expanded over time, and we've been using this to gather all the metrics from our replicate servers and tasks and feeding those into an Elastic Stack. This is one of our Kibana dashboards. Here we visualize key replicate metrics that we've collected by that REST API. You can see maximum latency by task, both current and over a period of time. And you can also see in the gauge what the overall average latency is across our replicate estate. At CDL, we're running multiple database migrations at once, so it's important to see overall uh, impact on things like network connections. CPU and memory utilization is also shown here by both server and task. And finally, at the bottom, you can see if the state of each task is good or bad. So with the steps for database migration defined and tested, you likely need to have to repeat them a lot. That's certainly what we had to do. And 
we recommend that you automate these steps. We created the change data capture tasks in the Click Replicate console and then exported the definition as JSON. And we used the JSON as a template and made each migration config driven, finding and replacing specific client variables like host name and schema names. The automated migration process could then have an input file of variables and the process builds out all the required scripts with the correct customer specific values. At the start of the migration, we lock our Oracle database accounts. Rollback then, if we needed to, was just a case of unlocking the Oracle database accounts and switching back the application endpoint. By deploying all of this as infrastructure as code, you get many benefits. Reducing risk, automation removes the human element. I'm not gonna be my best doing a manual deployment late at night, for example. At some point, I'm going to make a mistake. You're gonna get the same thing every time with infrastructure as code, so you get consistency across your environments. And also speed of deployment. Automation allows you to roll out changes quickly through multiple environments and for multiple customers without having to scale up your team. So after the initial migration of a database into a development environment, you'll typically start up your application. And this is what happened to us. Well, first of all, it failed. There are lots of connection initiation SQL statements being run from our application trying to select from the dual table. And this is an Oracle only thing. We created a dual table in PostgreSQL to get up and running and then refactored the application later on. For the second attempt uh, application uh, startup, um, it did actually start up, but for us it was way too slow. And we had developers saying that this screen used to take three seconds and now it's taking two minutes or even timing out. And looking at the SQL, we saw a horrendous number of joins and it was also bringing back lots of unnecessary columns. At this point, we changed about 10 uh, database, view, uh, database views um, and then continued with the tuning um, once the application could start up and was usable. So let's go through some of the things um, that we used in our tuning process. First of all, the join collapse limit uh, parameter. This influences the query planner to rewrite explicit join constructs. Smaller values set for this parameter reduce planning time, but may yield inferior query plans. And this is what happened with us. Because the query planner does not always choose the optimal join order, advanced users can elect to set uh, and tailor the value for this variable. Next, the from collapse limit. This is very similar to the join collapse limit. Again, the planner will merge um, uh, subqueries into upper queries if the resulting from list would have no more than the uh, item specified uh, in this parameter. Smaller values reduce planning time, but might yield inferior query plans. Workmem. This sets the base maximum amount of memory to be used by a query operation, such as a sort, before writing um, the data to temporary disk files. The default value is four megabytes, and for us, this was too low. Note that for complex queries, several sort or hash operations might be running in parallel. Each operation will generally be allowed to use as much memory as this uh, value for this parameter specifies before it starts to write uh, the data into temporary files. Sort operations are used for order by distinct and merge joins, and hash tables are used in hash joins, hash-based aggregation, result cache nodes, and hash-based processing of in subqueries. The PG stat statements mo st sorry, the PG stat statements module provides a means for tracking, uh, planning, and execution statistics of all SQL statements executed by a server. The module must be loaded by adding PG stat statements to the shared preload libraries in your PostgreSQL comp file. Um, this is because it requires additional shared memory. If you're working in Amazon RDS, then this is just a parameter group change. And the statistics gathered by the module are made available via a view named PG stat statements. This view contains one row um, for each distinct combination of database ID, user ID, and query ID. The PG pre-war module provides a convenient way to load relational data into either the operating system buffer cache or the PostgreSQL buffer cache. 
Pre pre warming can be performed manually using the PG pre warm function, but in our case, we perform this automatically by including PG pre warm in the shared preload libraries. Next, it's a good idea for you to turn on logging for any statement that is taking longer than it should do. For us, we set this at around one second and we send all of the logs to Elasticsearch. At this point, we identified a number of slow uh, pieces of SQL and we ended up changing about 60 views, adding them to the development database one at a time and testing them before putting them into the code base. We still have the predictive dashboard that we use to identify the poorly performing SQL. And this means if we get rubbish SQL, we see it in a non-production environment before it affects customers. Next up, tools. We tried lots of tools out. Um, for example, having PostgreSQL logs shipped to AWS CloudWatch logs, Amazon RDS Performance Insights. This is a database performance tuning and monitoring feature that helps you quickly assess the load of your database. PG Badger. This is a PostgreSQL log analysis report tool. But for us, what happened organizationally was much more interesting. The DBAs were now using Amazon RDS, and because of this, they were not having to install the database software. So they had more time to work directly with the development teams on making our software better. We suddenly found we were doing DevOps. DBAs sat next to developers working together and not having to raise tickets to pass between teams. So I touched there on the DBAs not installing database software. And obviously Amazon RDS is also handling uh, a database patching, a database backups. So that raises the question of what do the DBAs do now? Well, at CDL, the answer to this is automation on top of the automation. They build and maintain Terraform for our infrastructure as code. They build and maintain pipelines. They're using a tool called Atlantis so that they can roll out new environments through config. They also move on the database top technology much faster than they were ever able to do when we were running on-premise. Historically, Oracle 11G to 12C upgrade on-premise took us a year to complete. Now we have Amazon RDS and automation, we can move between major versions of PostgreSQL in four weeks. We're actually throttling this ourselves. We could do them all in one night if we needed to. We can roll out new clients faster. We can roll out critical bug fixes faster. We can really go as fast as the business needs us to go. The technology is no longer the bottleneck. It's actually risk appetite from CDL or our customers. The DBAs think a lot about CDL growing and our company strategy. What happens when we have a thousand databases, 2000 databases? Well, we know through the use of Amazon RDS and the automation that the DBAs have put in, we can scale to deliver the company strategy. This automation doesn't just happen, of course, but when you're not installing database software, patching it and, and making sure you write backup scripts, you now have a lot more time to do it. Automation has also improved the developer experience at CDL. The DBAs have enhanced self-service functionality, which they have built on using Rundeck. Developers often require clones of production databases to work through potential bugs or test at production volumes. And through the self-service portal, developers can create their own database clones. An automated process does a point in time recovery of a production database to a new instance. We downsize the instance class and make it single AZ to save on costs. A masking process that is then run to protect sensitive data. And finally, Temporary credentials are provided to, to the developer. On premise for large clients, this process could take about 18 hours, but the DBAs have optimized this in the cloud by creating and masking clones for each production database every weekend. RDS snapshots are taken and then, then made available to non-production AWS accounts. Now the self-service uh, process uses PG Transport to import the data into a developer's instance. So a typical 18 hour process on premise now takes 18 minutes in the cloud and an eight, and an eight terabyte database is ready within about 30 minutes. Developers also want to check configuration data in clients environments. So we've made pre-approved queries available to be executed against production databases by self-service. 
In the event of a customer facing incident, DBAs would often get asked to run a health check on the database to help triage. This health check has been scripted up and made available directly to the service center for them to run without having to wait for a DBA. Customer testing has also been improved as cloning from production to training in UAT environments is automated and can be requested through the self-service portal. DBAs are no longer needed to export and import data. The database at CDL has become a product. Yes, we've built it on top of Amazon RDS, but we've added um, CDL specific value through um, the automation and the product features built out by our DBA team. The DBAs have moved to being data engineers. They write code, they create automated processes, they're building a product. They are also learning new skills as the move to the data engineer job title has allowed them to work on more types of projects using technologies like EMR, Python, Spark, Hoodie, Athena and QuickSight, just to name a few. To support seamless integration and deployment of applications with RDS, AWS established the Amazon RDS Service Ready program. And this helps customers identify products that are already integrated with AWS services like RDS so that those customers can spend less time evaluating new tools and more time scaling the use of their products. CDL have achieved two Amazon Relational Database Service Ready designations and we will launch partners for both. In order to receive an Amazon RDS Ready designation, we had to demonstrate that our products followed AWS architecture, security and reliability best practices to integrate with Amazon RDS. If anybody's ever worked with the well-architected tool, it's a very similar idea and process to that. Obviously, the focus is on RDS. I'll go through some of the key criteria that helped us make best use of RDS. First of all, connection pooling. RDS Ready states that if the application frequently opens and closes many short-lived connections, then it should use connection pooling. Applications that keep a large number of connections open for longer periods of time without much activity should also use connection pooling. Our application is a Java EE application that runs within a Pyara application server, and the components for the application use a number of database connection pools. We have three main JDBC connection pools. The application is deployed in a Pyara Docker container, and the Docker file that you can see here has environment variables that specify the JDBC connection pool sizes. And there's also an environment variable here to apply statement and connection leak detection. And this is a feature that allowed us to set specific timeouts so that, F, it, so that if SQL statements or JDBC connections haven't been closed by an application, potentially leading to a, mem a memory leak, they can be logged and or closed. RDS Ready states that database credentials must not be logged out. And there are a few ways that you can achieve this. Most of the time at CDL, we use Systems Manager Parameter Store with secure strings. And then application deployments can make a call to the um, Systems Manager APIs to retrieve credentials that that IAM roles allow them access to. This avoids embedding secrets in files. AWS Secrets Manager integrates with RDS and third-party tools like HashiCorp's Vault offer very similar functionality. The AWS uh, Foundational Technical Reviews also state that since July this year, temporary credentials should, never, um, should be used whenever possible. RDS allows for this through the IAM authentication feature. With IAM authentication tokens, when they're used, each token has a lifetime of about 15 minutes. For business applications where data encryption is a requirement, and I really can't think of a use case where that wouldn't be these days, the product um, that you're building that integrates with Amazon RDS must support encryption for its data at rest and in transit. For us, encryption at rest is enabled through our Terraform infrastructure as code. We have a customized parameter group um, that enables um, um, the storage within RDS to be encrypted using a customer specific KMS key. And the parameter group is also updated to force connections to use SSL. 
The other parameters on screen here uh, to highlight are the PG stat statements and the log min minimum duration, um, as these were used as part of our proactive tuning that I mentioned earlier on in the talk. Next up, database failure and performance. Products that connect directly to an Amazon RDS instance to be RDS ready must continue to function in the event of a database failover. And the AWS Partners pre-release performance testing process must include testing against Amazon RDS instances specifically. So for us, RDS instances are created using Terraform infrastructure as code, and we set a default value for the corresponding Route 53 entry, um, the TTL, uh, set to a low value. We test database failover as part of a performance testing. And for performance testing and failover testing, um, we use a set of performance tests that we've built out using Gatling, which is an open source load and performance testing framework. As we're in InsureTech, the, we run a private car insurance quote simulation because this is our busiest workload, and this is run for about 30 minutes. At the 10 minute point, we force RDS to fail over from the primary to standby instance. At this point, the application briefly loses connectivity. Uh, in our case, the failover takes about three minutes. Once failed over, the application recovers connectivity to Amazon RDS automatically and continues to function as expected. So I mentioned uh, during the standard migration steps that we found an Oracle feature in our business intelligence solution that had no equivalent in PostgreSQL. This was fast refresh materialized views. Our BI solution takes about 700 database tables that have been optimized for online transaction processing and denormalizes that data into about 100 materialized views that are optimized for analytics workloads. We had to build out this fast refresh materialized view capability from scratch. And we worked with experts from the AWS Database Freedom team to deliver this. We've open sourced the project and we continue to maintain it. The principal data engineer on our migration project was Tony Mullen. And he's written a guest blog for AWS all about this, which is well worth a read if you run PostgreSQL database. He must have done a good job because he now works for AWS as a senior specialist solutions architect specializing in RDS. If you scan the QR code on screen, you'll find links to both the GitHub repo and Tony's blog post. This is the architecture that we've built out for fast refresh views in, in PostgreSQL. Using database triggers, we capture transactions taking place in the underlying tables that are used for the materialized views. These transactions are stored in additional tables shown here as materialized view logs. When we want to update the materialized view, instead of running SQL to completely refresh all of the data, we just bring that data up to date by processing only the changes that have taken place since the last refresh. By using this fast refresh technology, we can achieve a latency as low as one minute from the original transaction taking place. So I'll walk through now the process of creating and refreshing materialized views using the CDL open source fast refresh materialized view capability. And this is done from the point of once the uh, fast refresh module has been installed into the database. Again, refer to the GitHub repo, which has full step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. The first step is to create your materialized view logs for the source table that make up the view that you're going to create. Materialized view logs are used to track changes being made to the source table. The second step is to create the materialized view itself. So here we pass in the name of the view that we're creating, the SQL statement that we need to build the view, the owner of the view, and we've set the fast refresh parameter to true. At the end of this execution, the uh, result of the SQL story will be stored in a new materialized view. Next, we make changes to the source table that make up the materialized view. So here we can see an update being made against table test one. And finally, we refresh the materialized view. So this is uh, what you do when you want to update your materialized view with the changes that have been made to the source tables since the view was last created or refreshed. And typically at CDL, we schedule this to be run um, 
every 50, about every 15 minutes. And you could do this with a PG cron um, or um, a Lambda function or any kind of cron based uh, scheduling tool. So here's a demo of the actual process in action. So you can see we've got tables test one through to test six. And I'm going to make an update to table test one. So you can see the value for goodbye has changed to reinvent. Next, I'm going to navigate to my materialized view. And you can see it still has the original value of goodbye. So we need to refresh the um, materialized view with just the change that's taken place since it was created. We navigate back to the materialized view and refresh. The value has now been updated with reinvent. The important thing to remember though is that the SQL to create that material materialized view hasn't been rerun. The only transaction that's been applied is changing the value from goodbye to reinvent. So your IO is massively reduced. Okay, one final tip to close. AWS obviously gives you some awesome building blocks um, for things like uh, relational database service, analytics functions, etc., etc. But for our migration to succeed at scale, we needed to, the help of all of our teams. Engineers, of course, to do all of the things I've spoken about during this talk, but we also required our legal, compliance, project management, service management, and customer teams to make our flagship product cloud only. We've recognized every migration by hanging a cloud at a campus in Stockport. After the last migration completed, we held a cloud celebration day. Over 200 CDL people came to our campus for food, drinks, and fun. We recognized key individuals, but everybody at CDL was given an extra day holiday to celebrate this success. Thanks very much for listening and please take a moment to fill out the session survey feedback.